In addition to all these curricula and handbooks and teaching manuals, Dr. Fradis has also created and implemented a 12-step wellness program called Paving the Path to Wellness for both patients and providers. Uh, she is the Director of Lifestyle Medicine and Wellness for the Department of Surgery at Mass General, um, in addition to her own consulting and coaching practice. And today she's going to be talking to us, working about working toward a healthy body, peaceful mind and joyful heart with lifestyle medicine principles and practice. So welcome, Dr. Frades, <laughs> to her. <laughs> <Somewhat>. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, this unusual is, presentation. <laughs> this has been most unusual, but look, we're going to forge forward and we are going to work towards a healthy body, peaceful mind, and joyful heart. And we're going to use lifestyle medicine principles and practice to do so. So, my disclosures are as follows I am on the Scientific Advisory Board of Jenny Craig. I've been on that for 10 years and I talk about health and wellness coaching with them. Do the same thing on the Medical Advisory Board of Obvious Solutions. And I do have my own lifestyle medicine coaching practice, Energy. While we're together today, forging forward, we're going to identify strategies to enhance health and happiness through the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. Some of you are saying, what are the six pillars of lifestyle medicine? And others are saying, I know what they are. If you want to chat them in, go ahead. I'm going to share them with you today. I'm going to demonstrate the power of the six plus. So you may know the six pillars of lifestyle medicine, but I'm going to share with you six more dimensions of health and well-being that add to the healthy body, peaceful mind, and joyful heart. We're going to highlight some new things for you, hopefully, some things that are evidence-based because lifestyle medicine is evidence-based, some things that are evidence-based that you can use today. And you may not even have thought about these little tweaks you can make in your day. Now, look, I know you're all very busy and I don't want you to have added pressure. I want you to have something that's going to add time to your schedule. We're going to look at tweaks, the way we use our mind, the way we use our forks, the way we use our feet, and also the way we set ourselves up for sleep, the way we communicate, the way we use our words with others and with ourselves. And let's get going. So we have the six pillars of lifestyle medicine, exercise, nutrition, sleep, stress resilience, social connection, and avoidance of risky substances. For exercise, the guidelines are to achieve 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity each week. Moderate intensity means you can talk, but you cannot sing. If you can't talk while you're exercising, then you're invigorous. And all you need is 75 minutes of vigorous physical activity in the week. You want more benefits? Double what, what I just said. So for moderate intensity, go up to 300 minutes of physical activity in the week. For vigorous, go up to 150. How can you do this without adding more time to the day? Well, you can get a portable peddler. And you could, be, you could be pedaling right now underneath your desk or wherever you are, you could choose right now to stand and walk in place. So during these Zoom meetings, which you have, I know, many each day, you could be using this time to be moving your body. We also want to avoid sitting, sedentary behavior, because that has its own pathological physiology that increases triglycerides, decreases HDL, and disrupts our ability to utilize glucose. So exercise is a major pillar. And we did learn about this, most of us in medical school or in our healthcare professional schools, nursing, physical therapy, nutrition. This is something we don't learn a lot about in healthcare, especially in medical school. We're trying to change that. I was just at our nutrition summit in Chicago, American College of Graduate Medical Education met to see how we could put nutrition into the core curriculum. What is the focus here? Fruits and vegetables, plants, a plant slant. To try to have half your plate, fruits and vegetables, a quarter whole grains, and then a quarter of healthy protein, nuts, seeds, legumes, beans, tofu. This would be great if you like fish, it has omega-3 fatty acids, just be careful of the mercury. 
avoid the processed red meats, limit the red meat if you're worried about cardiovascular disease. So the Harvard Healthy Plate is a great template to follow. Half fruits and vegetables, quarter whole grains, quarter healthy protein. Sleep, we all need it. Seven to nine hours, you know it. You need it to be a cave, cool, dark, and quiet. Cool, so what's the best temperature for sleep? 70 degrees max, 60 degrees minimum. Sweet spot, 67 degrees. So one thing you could do today to help yourself improve your sleep is to set your thermostat in your bedroom to 67 degrees so that you can enjoy a drop in your core body temperature, which is a signal for sleep. Another signal for sleep, melatonin release from the pineal gland. If you get blue wavelength, light from your screen, from your any screen that would be phone, iPad, computer, television, blue wavelength light blocks the release of melatonin from the pineal gland. So we need to block blue wavelength light at least three hours before bed with goggles or glasses that block blue wavelength light, or you could get apps that can block it. So that's a, that's a really important tip. Then adenosine builds up, ATP is broken up throughout the day. Adenosine builds up to a max around 11 p.m. Adenosine is a signal, makes us sleepy. So let that be. Work yourself, exercise. Exercise is connected to better sleep. Problem is caffeine, it competes with the same receptor as adenosine. So if you have caffeine 3 p.m. or later, half of it's gonna be in your system by 9 p.m. because it has a half-life of four to six hours. So these are simple tips and tricks that you can change right now. It's not adding extra time to your day. Just change when you're drinking coffee. Make sure it's only in the morning, two to three cups. Don't have it after three. You really don't have it after noon. Change your patterning before bed. And these are some simple things you can do. Hopefully you're standing up right now and walking in place, trying to get your 150 minutes. And then stress resilience, a hmm, little, <laughs> little more complicated. We'll go through more of that. Social connection how we speak to people with honor and respect and inclusivity at all times. And then avoiding tobacco, alcohol is our healthiest way to go. You'll see these six pillars in the Paving the Path to Wellness program, where we're talking about the healthy body, peaceful mind, joyful heart, and then these action steps. You can have a lot of information and data, but if you don't set action steps like SMART goals and continue to investigate trial and error, and to try new things and have a variety of stress resiliency techniques, a variety of physical activity, a variety of vegetables on your plate, then you won't reach your optimal state of health and wellness. So for the body, typical medical terminology and areas of focus, physical activity, nutrition, and sleep. For the mind, stress resiliency. Mm, then some things we don't talk that much about in medicine are attitude. You know, all important timeouts, taking your vacation, unplugging completely from work. You're actually more productive when you get back. There are programs at Harvard. One hospital says they will give you uh, money, actually. They'll give you a reward if you don't check in on your email. And they know when you check in because you're checking in on your work email. So it's, it's, it, we're really trying to emphasize take your vacation and take time out. Then for this joyful heart, some may call this spiritual work. For some, it may be religious work. But for all, we need meaning and purpose. Tate Shanafeld's work from Stanford, looking at burnout in physicians and healthcare providers, a lot of it is connected to a loss of a sense of purpose. We need to reconnect with our meaning and purpose in life. We must prioritize our, so our social systems and connections. At Spalding here in Boston, one of the Harvard affiliates where I'm located, we're trying our best to reconnect. There is no physician's lounge. We aren't having chit chat sessions on the sidelines. Like when we were in the hallway, we could just say, hey, how are you? How's your son doing? How's he feeling? I know he wasn't well. That's gone because we're not seeing each other so much as on Zoom now. We're not even together for grand rounds. It's on Zoom. So we are trying to now have well-being rounds four or five times a year instead of grand rounds. You get CME for it. It's called well-being rounds. We lecture and we have research for the first half hour. Then we go into small breakout sessions, short, small breakout sessions of 20 minutes. And I meet new people all the time. My department is 100 people, 100 physicians, plus 
about that of nursing staff and PT, and we're all together and we connect for short periods of time in breakout sessions in Zoom. A great way, a small change you can make to help cultivate connection. Then it's about energy management. It's about, do I have the energy to do this? You may have the time to do this, but do you have the energy to do this? So I always talk about this time where I put three presentations in one day, one in Charlestown, one in Brookline, one in Needham. So it, time-wise, it worked out. I could do this in the time that was allotted, but do you know how stressful it is to, to drive around Boston? First of all, you know, Boston drivers are the worst. I'm from New York, so I can say this, but I've lived here for now 25 years, but still Boston drivers, they, they're honking at you. They're cutting you off. It's very stressful being behind the wheel, even if you're a passive driver. So that day, even though I had the time to do all of that, the parking, the running around, I was just exhausted. Like I had, I had just run a marathon when it was just three presentations, but I realized energy management's the key. When do you have your most energy? When do you have your least energy? Think about your projects in the day. Think about how much energy, not just time, how much energy will they take? I love giving presentations. It's one of my favorite things to do, but <laughs> I do use a lot of energy. So I try not to do more than really two a day. All right, so let's get into some details. First, it's paving the path to wellness. It's a mnemonic, hopefully you can remember, to consider not just the six pillars, but the six pillars plus. Remember the attitude, remember variety, investigations, goal setting, timeouts, energy management, and stress resiliency. One of my favorite slides ever is talking about how physical activity impacts your brain. Now, we know and we learned in medical school and we learned in our healthcare professional schools that it's good for your heart. We know this exercise is good for our heart. It's also really good for your brain. Dopamine is released, improves motivation, focus, learning, blood flow to the brain increases so we get rid of waste products more easily. Serotonin is released. We have serotonin uptake inhibitors, which as you know, are antidepressants. Exercise does the same thing for us. I read a study just two days ago that said, actually exercise may be even better than antidepressants. Now look, I'm not saying get rid of antidepressants for you or your patients, but I'm saying let's honor that movement is really medicine. Then this endorphin release, some of us get it, some of us don't. Try, try stretching if you don't get it from running or aerobic activity. Norepinephrine is released, improving attention, perception, motivation. BDNF is released. A lot of people don't even know what that is. These are physicians that have been practicing for 20, 25 years, don't know what BDNF is. Maybe in rehab with stroke survivors that really need to know about BDNF, which is neurogenesis. It's miracle grow for the brain, BDNF. It increases the number of neurons in our brain and we can change the size, the volume of our hippocampus. So we can improve and in, keep our memory. And dementia is one of the things most people are concerned about when we think about chronic conditions. Yes, heart disease, yes, diabetes. A lot of people are really worried about their thoughts, their memories, dementia. Speaking about thoughts, William James. This goes into attitude. The greatest discovery of my generation is that a human being can alter their lives by altering their attitudes, the way they look at things, the way they perceive things, the lens with which they view their existence, their own narrative about their day, their own narrative about their life. This brings in a little bit about meaning. Viktor Frankl talks about suffering equals despair minus meaning. So we all are going to experience despair. But when we can put some meaning into that despair, that difficult time, we make some meaning. Out of it. We have a narrative that makes meaning out of that difficult time. Then we, 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 don't, we don't get into this perpetual feeling of, of, of suffering. So that's something to think about. What attitudes do we want to cultivate? We want to cultivate positivity. I'll ask you now to identify positive emotions in the day. Positive emotions that you feel or can feel or have felt in the day. You can chat them in. Barbara Fredrickson has identified 10. We're going to review them in a moment. 
it's good to know what positive emotions we're thinking about, talking about. Positive psychology, Marty Seligman, the father of positive psychology, brought this into the scientific community in the 2000s. There's a lot of research on how if we look at things with a lens of positivity, we can be more creative, have more creativity. We all have problems throughout our day. Now, when we look at these problems and we say to ourselves, what can I learn from this problem? In fact, if we say to ourselves, how do I reach higher ground from this problem? and we keep a positive lens, we're much more likely to be creative and find a good solution. I just wanna bring us back to physical activity to remind you that there was a great study from Stanford that said, if you walk for 20 minutes versus if you sit for 20 minutes, if you walk for 20 minutes, your divergent thinking goes up about 63, 65%. Divergent thinking, out of the box thinking goes up. So another thing we can do to increase our creativity and positivity and reduce stress is the walking. So all of these pillars and dimensions you'll see are interconnected. Growth mindset. When I learned this, Carol Dweck's work at Stanford, hopefully some of you know about it. If not, I would dive into it. This changed my life. Growth mindset. Growth mindset is any mishap is an opportunity to learn and grow. So any failure. Uh-oh, somebody said the word failure. Yes, I said the word failure. The failure. It's an opportunity to learn and grow. That's what it is. A mishap, a mistake. We can all learn and grow from these things. Then we're able to take risks. We're able to go out of our comfort zone because we know if we have a mishap, it's all right. We'll learn and grow from this mishap. We, we don't really like writing papers. We don't really like doing research. We feel anxious about it. We feel that we're not good at it. Well, guess what? <laughs> That probably means you need to try and do it and give it, an, give it a go and learn as you go. Ask questions, try. I, I saw someone chat in a, a, a good little, uh, uh, a good little um, tip about uh, making a mistake. You're really just learning. It's a, it's a step to learning. Every time you make a mistake, it's a step toward a better solution. And then gratitude. You know, there's a lot of research. Marty Seligman did a lot of this original research on gratitude, showing that if you practice gratitude, as in sending a thank you note, who does that? But a handwritten note, I still try to do it, but most people don't. But you could send it by email, by text, by, I don't know, DM. Somehow send a note of gratitude. You feel better. You feel better. And so does the person who received the note. It works both ways. So expressing this gratitude is something that we want to bring into our work environment at the Department of Surgery at MGH when we went through a lesson on gratitude and we went through some stress resiliency sessions. They started their meetings. One section in surgery started their meetings by expressing a word, a thing, a person, an event, a project, a something that they were grateful for in that moment. And then they, everybody went around the table and said it. And then they went into their meeting and they said the meetings were more collegial, more productive when they started with this attitude of gratitude. All right. So I don't know if anyone chimed in on what the positive emotions are, but here we go. It's from Barbara Fredrickson. So joy, serenity, hope, amusement, a little laughter, awe, gratitude, interest. Hopefully you're interested in this, so you're feeling a little good because maybe you're interested in what's going to happen next. Sense of pride. This is not arrogance at all. This is being, this is being aware of your accomplishment and acknowledging that you did a good job and a little pat on your back. It's important because it's a release of dopamine. It's a reward. When we reach a goal, SMART goal, specific, measurable, action-oriented, realistic, time-sensitive, when we reach a goal, when we reach a target, we feel good. It's a squirt of dopamine in the reward system, substantia nigra. We, we literally feel good. So give yourself that. Give yourself that reward. Celebrate. We don't celebrate enough. We need to celebrate small successes. It helps us be motivated to continue and move forward. Inspiration. 
and, and love. These are all forms of positivity that can help us stay motivated, stay creative. And here is the Growth Mindset book that I was telling you about with Carol Dweck. I love, love this work. Theories of Intelligence, TOI. She has a six-point Likert scale. You could look it up on the internet and test yourself, see if you have a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. Here's a question on the Likert scale. You have a certain amount of intelligence and you really cannot do much to change it. That's a fixed mindset. So in a growth mindset, it's at this moment, I'm not able to do calculus yet. But if I try hard, if I learn, if I get a tutor, <laughs> if I get someone to sit with me and I really practice the equations, I bet I can get better instead of I'm no good at math. You know, people, I don't, let, first of all, I always love math. Probably you guys did too. But there are people that say, I'm not good at math, just point blank. I need to practice a little bit more. I can get better at math. I didn't do well on that math test, but I'm going to look at my errors. I'm going to see what, what I did incorrectly. And I'm going to figure out how I can do better next time. That's the growth mindset. This is actually great for parenting. I don't know. I can't tell how old or young people are on the screen. This is great for parenting. This is great for connecting with your own parents, with your partner. <laughs> this is just colleagues. This is just really good work in general. Now, I'll tell you, this was given out at Harvard Medical School when it first came out. The business school got it first. My husband's a business school guy. And then it came to the Harvard Medical School and we started also utilizing this and utilizing Barbara Fredrickson's three to one ratio for positivity. Say three positive things for every one constructive piece of advice or feedback. So with the students we were instructed, make sure you give them something to work on because they all want to get better and be the best doctor they can be. But definitely tell them and celebrate their good qualities and the good things they've done and make, make the ratio three to one. There are some little tidbits that we use for the students that we can use mm, for our own lives, for colleagues, for mentees, for residents. And it's important because it impacts us too as physicians. This was a piece on burnout. Physicians are immersed in a culture that perpetually defers self-care and responds to errors with shame and blame. We really have to get the shame and blame out of this room and out of every room and the hospital and at, well, out of every room in your house would be nice too. Just get shame, blame, and guilt out of your head. We want to learn and grow and that's the growth mindset. If you're in a growth mindset, you don't spend time shaming and blaming yourself or those around you. A higher percentage of physicians condemn themselves when they make an error compared to people in other fields. 52% of physicians put off self-care and only 15% of people in other fields do so for self-report questionnaires. It's recommended that physicians work with coaches or therapists to reframe, this is attitude, Reframe mistakes as opportunities to learn and grow. This is that gratitude work. This is Marty Seligman, just because amusement and a giggle is also a form of positive <laughs> positivity. This is him in the 70s. He doesn't look like this now. You can Google him and, and check him out. But I just, I get a giggle out of that one. So here's one of his earlier studies. That's why it's an earlier picture of him. It's 411 subjects compared to the effects of five weekly assignments. So there was the placebo control exercise, just having students talk about early memories. Then there was the gratitude visit, had the students write and hand deliver a letter of gratitude. Then there was the three good things in life exercise, write three things that went well each day and their causes for these five weeks. You at your best, write about a time when you were at your best and consider your strengths. Then another exercise, using signature strengths in a new way. Think about your top five strengths. You can find these in the values in action, VIA, character strengths, Marty Seligman's positive psychology. He put together a VIA character strengths survey for free that you can do online. And so the students did that. They had their top strengths and then use one of their top five strengths in a new and different way for one week. These were the weekly assignments. And what were the outcomes? Well, 
using signature strengths in a new way, three good things, that exercise, those two exercises, increased happiness and decreased depressive symptoms in those students. And they were continually monitored. And that, those two exercises helped them for six months. It's pretty profound. Simple exercises we could do. We could have our mentees do. We could have our students do. We could have our kids do. We could have our colleagues do. Another one, writing and personally delivering that letter of gratitude to someone who had never been properly thanked revealed an immediate increase in happiness score and the benefits lasted one month. So writing that gratitude down, that actual handwritten thank you note. I don't know the last time you did that, but I have received some. I still have a box of them. I keep them in a box actually. Anyway, they really can touch you deeply. And then because they're handwritten and they're, they're, they're concrete, you can go back and look at them. Here's that V in the paving. Variety is the very spice of life that gives it all of its flavor. So we need to try a variety. I gave you not just growth mindset. I asked you to talk about and think about positivity, positive emotions. I asked you to think about the growth mindset. And now for exercise, we also have to do strength training, flexibility, balance, as well as that aerobic training. We want to have a rainbow of vegetables on the plate because every color has a different phytonutrient, a different antioxidant that can be helpful to you to fight disease and inflammation. Let's talk a little bit about food. <laughs> food, and we're talking about health and happiness. So we're going to do food and mental health relationship between food and perceived stress and depressive symptoms among university students. And this was in the UK. It's a correlational study. It's pretty small, but it's interesting. 3,706 survey study, looking at foods associated with stress and depressive symptoms. What were the findings? This may not surprise you, but here it is in black and white. Consuming unhealthy foods, which were considered sweets, cookies, snacks, fast food, was significantly associated with perceived stress in the women, the females in the study, and depressive symptoms in both the males and females. Now, consuming healthy foods, what, was, what were they? Fresh fruits, salads, cooked vegetables specifically. Those were associated the opposite way. So when people were consuming these healthy foods, they had less perceived stress, less depressive symptoms. And that was true for both sexes. So what we eat can truly impact our mood. So what foods are associated with a good mood? Bananas, dark chocolate. So that's good news for some people. Fermented foods, oats, berries, nuts, seeds, coffee. Remember having that in the morning before noontime anyway. Beans and lentils. So if you're looking to food for a good mood, check out that list and use investigations yourself as the experiment. You are in fact the subject and the experimenter. Try different things that we're talking about today and see how they work for you. And, and I would suggest you do this each week, set some smart goals see how you do with them, see how you feel. Remember, you can go out of your comfort zone because you're going to have a growth mindset. And then you're going to have these specific, measurable, action-oriented, realistic, time-sensitive, smart goals. Not just, I'm going to eat more veggies. How about I'm going to add a purple vegetable on Monday. I'm going to add some orange and red vegetables on Wednesday. And I'm going to load up on greens on Friday. I'm going to shoot to have five servings of vegetables each day. Get as specific as you can. Maybe you want to say five days out of the week. If you're not currently consuming a lot of vegetables, maybe you want to say you're going to add one serving of vegetable five days this week. You'll do what suits you and what's realistic for you, but make sure this is action oriented and it's specific. We've got to talk about the sleep. Because sleep insufficiency syndrome, people are thinking about making this an actual diagnosis. You know, the American Heart Association added sleep 
as its essential eight, you have essential seven, remember? Then in April, 2022, they added sleep to make essential eight. Why? Because the data is so clear. With insufficient sleep, you're more likely to have depression, accidents because of reaction time, effect on traffic safety. We talked about hypertension, type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity, medical errors, risk-taking behavior. When we are sleep deprived, impacts our academic performance, learning, interpersonal relationships. Why? When you're sleep deprived, you're 30% more likely to have an amygdala flare. Do you know what I mean by amygdala flare? I'm not sure, but I'm just going to tell you that amygdala flare means your amygdala in your limbic system that reacts to any kind of threat and it gives a large emotional response and you're really working off emotions, not your prefrontal cortex, the CEO of your brain where you're organized and you're, you're thinking and you're, 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 you're rational. No, instead with an amygdala flare, it's all emotions and people can be trying to talk to you and be rational with you, but you don't see it because you're just working off your amygdala and your emotions. Now you may be in the presence of someone that's having an amygdala flare. It's very frustrating because you're trying to rationalize with them and they just don't hear you. 30% more likely when you're sleep deprived, something good for kids to know for you to help your kids with sleep, spouses, parents, and colleagues. All right. Social functioning, moral judgment, logical reasoning, cognitive functioning, mood, reaction time, psychomotor function, decision-making, thinking, vigilance. All this is, is impaired when we have insufficient sleep syndrome. All right. What else? Sleep insufficiency is associated with a significant increase in the desire for weight promoting or high calorie or called hyper palatable salt on top of sugar on top of fat food items following sleep loss, magnitude of which was proportional to the subjective severity of sleep loss across participants. So the more sleep deprived you are, the more you reach for these hyper palatables, such that in another study, volunteers who slept only four hours ate 300 extra calories compared to those who got nine hours of rest. This is the study on sleep deprivation, comparing this to blood alcohol concentration. This is a study from Australia. Being awake 18 hours, blood alcohol concentration 0.05. Being awake 24 hours, blood alcohol concentration 0.10. And you know 0.08 is legally drunk. So it impacts our reaction time. Timeouts. I told you it's important for our sense of peaceful mind that was taking vacations. That's a very clear timeout. We sometimes need short mini timeouts in the day when things are not going well. There's been a mishap. There's been a misunderstanding. There's currently an argument going on. Instead of being part of that, because part of that might be someone else's amygdala flare, the best thing to do is take a timeout when someone's having an amygdala flare. How do you get a timeout? You excuse yourself. Excuse me, I need to go to the bathroom. Go to the bathroom, take some deep breaths. Use this as what we call an empowerment moment, a timeout. It's just like in, in team sports. They take a timeout. Why? They're, they're losing. <laughs> the, the, the momentum is in the favor of the other team. Things are going awry. So stop. Re, reassess. Slow down. Pause. Get a new strategy. Empower yourself. Use positivity, right? Use pride, use joy, use awe, use amusement, use something and go back into it. Then go back at it. Go back into the room, go back into the meeting after your empowerment moment. Now you don't need to go to the bathroom. You can go outside, take a walk, whatever you, whatever you need to do. But no one stops you when you say, excuse me one second, I need to use the bathroom. And then, you know, then no one asks you questions. <laughs> Research shows us breaks increase productivity. When you feel your focus decline, take a walk, sit quietly, take deep breaths. Set an alarm to go off every hour. First of all, because you want to stand every hour, right? You can also take a break in concentration. A few deep breaths, walk outside, something. You only need five or 10 minutes to regroup, rejuvenate, then get back to work. And studies show those people that are on this timer of an hour, they're actually more productive. This was from cognition over a decade ago. We should be using this. Some people, it's a 90-minute cycle, just so you know. If you're thinking, wait, I can actually concentrate for longer than 60 minutes, okay. So it's 60 to 90-minute cycles. Uh, but remember, for sedentary behavior, we do want to stand every hour. But if you have diabetes or pre-diabetes, it's every half hour. Okay. 
focusing on natural sources of energy. I talked about energy management. It's important that we think about when we are energized in the day. For me, it's early morning. I like to get up at 6 a.m. and get going, get working. For some people, they're night owls and they're really energized in the evening and the afternoon. Just know who you are when you have your most energy and put projects that require your focus, attention, and energy at those times. So I do my writing, research, that type of work in the morning when no one distracts me and I'm, I'm, I'm bright and, and bushy, bushy-tailed and ready to go in the morning. So some people use the caffeine throughout the day to enhance their energy. I already told you why that's a problem with adenosine. Some people use sweets, gives them that high, gives them that burst of energy. There's a natural lull in energy around 3 p.m. You could go out for a walk. You could have a little treat of nuts. Why? Because nuts have magnesium. We are often low in magnesium when we feel fatigued. Now, people don't go around checking magnesium levels. Well, you don't have to check your magnesium levels. If you're feeling fatigued and low and you know you're not eating a whole food plant predominant diet, you're not eating a lot of greens, you're not eating a lot of nuts, you can add those things. That will add magnesium and maybe that will increase your energy. You also know when you exercise, you increase the number of mitochondria in your muscles. We know this. This is just biology. So the more you exercise, the more mitochondria you'll have, the more energy you'll have. So we know that. Sleeping is going to help us with energy. The food we consume can help us with energy and can help our mood, as you just heard about. And being out in nature. More and more research. There's even recommendations to be out in nature 120 minutes total in the week. So you could do this twice on the weekends or in the, in the afternoons or in the evenings uh, after dinner, before dinner with your loved ones, whatever you may do. This can also help at your energy levels. If you have a dog, you can play with your dog or cat. You know that when you pet a cat or dog, you release oxytocin, which helps us to be energized and feel good. Different types of energy. So there's physical energy, self-regulation, frequent active leisure time can give us this physical energy activate our parasympathetic system. We have better recovery from stress and threat. Then there's emotional energy. So we talked about those 10 positive emotions, feeling them, focusing on them, identifying them, trying to actually embrace, embody them. And high quality connections can give us this type of emotional energy, gives us behavioral flexibility. Again, we talked about creativity, increase in positivity gives us creativity the capacity to see opportunity as I was discussing. Then there's mental energy, realistic optimism, positive self-talk, experiences of deep engagement or flow. You know, when you lose track of time because you're involved in a project or you're, you're, you're doing something, maybe you love knitting. Um, for me, sometimes it's jogging. For basketball players, it could be doing free throws. For other people, it could be paddle boarding or for accountants, it's certainly doing the, the mathematics involved. They get into flow, they lose track of time. That helps, that, that brings you energy when you're in flow like that. Mihai Cheek sent Mihai. He has a great book called Flow, if you want to look at that. And that's the capacity to concentrate, create, learn, bounce back. Then there's the spiritual energy. Do with that as you wish. It, 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 it's, it's something greater than ourselves. It's, it's having a why to live shared and valued purpose to our lives and awareness of our own values and what's important to us, our core values. And this gives us greater joy, tolerance for inevitable obstacles. When we feel we have this kind of spiritual energy, this, this why to live. And that's what we're going to go to next, the P in our paving the path to wellness and our steps, the purpose. The first P is physical activity. The next P is purpose. One of the single most important predictors of well being. Greater life satisfaction, greater physical health, more high quality connections, improved brain function for people that have a strong sense of purpose. They live longer. People in their 60s with a low life purpose, more than twice as likely to die within five years. Strong sense of purpose is a robust predictor. So we are less likely to die if we have a strong sense of purpose. This is a, a, a important study. If you're into this topic, area of medicine, 
you'll want to dive into a sense of purpose in life and five health behaviors in older adults. Higher sense of purpose at baseline was associated with a lower likelihood of developing unhealthy behaviors over time. Helping our young people, helping children, helping college age, helping young adults, helping our residents, helping our early career physicians, healthcare providers to connect to their sense of purpose and try to keep connecting what they're doing day to day with their sense of purpose. So 13,770 adults across eight years looked at top versus lowest quartile of purpose in life. Those that were in the top had a 24% lower likelihood of becoming physically inactive, 33% lower likelihood of developing sleep problems, 22% lower likelihood of developing unhealthy body mass index. And then there was a marginal reduction in smoking relapse with those with a sense of purpose. So many of you probably have connected with your purpose. Some of you may, may have lost it a little bit. That's what research shows. People in healthcare have lost it a little bit. So this is some strategies to reconnect with it or to help others that you know reconnect with their sense or connect with their sense of purpose in the first place. When are you in flow? When do you lose track of time? You ask the surgeons this and what do they say in the OR? You ask me this and it's counseling patients one-on-one. -on -one. It, two hours could go by and I'm still with the person trying to, trying to work on helping them sleep better or, or eat a more healthy diet closer to the Harvard Healthy Plate. And I just completely lose track of time. Another question asked, whose faces do you see when you think about love? What are you most willing to put effort into right now? If you were to write down your own obituary, what would be mo the most important for you to include? Some people use writing your obituary as an exercise to find your purpose. If you had a bonus day, free of all responsibilities, appointments, and commitments, and you were fully rested and recharged and could do anything you wanted for 12 hours, what would you do? Maybe you want to talk about these at dinner tonight or with your colleagues tomorrow. Stress, pressure or tension exerted on a material or object. That's engineering term. And when you have too much stress on a material object, it can break, right? We're talking about psychological stress a state of mental or emotional strain or tension resulting from adverse or very demanding circumstances. And we can also have deterioration and breakage if we are under too much stress for too long and we experience distress. Remember, there's eustress, a certain amount of stress that gets us into flow so that we can enjoy the moment, be fully engaged in the moment. That's flow. That's good stress. But what we want to identify is this distress or chronic stress. This is the book I told you about from Me High Cheek Sent Me High. It's called Flow. This graph here is important to look at. We have skill level on the x-axis. Y-axis has challenge at hand. When your skill level meets the challenge, you're in flow. That's why surgeons love to be in surgery. They're skilled at it. <laughs> they know what they're doing. They got a challenge and they get into flow. Ask me to do a heart transplant. Okay. I don't have the skills. That's a huge challenge. I'm in anxiety. Boredom. Ask me to read the cat in the hat a hundred times. Is that what that is? That that's going to put me to sleep. So what we want to do is find our sweet spot and get in the flow channel. So what if somebody says you have to write a 100 page chapter on EKGs tomorrow? That, that's anxiety or you lose your job. Okay? That's anxiety land. So how can you possibly change that? Well, you say, hey, could I have four months to do that? If, if you give me four months to do that, I, I might be able to get into flow. So change the deadline. Nope, can't change the deadline. Okay, can you cut that down to 20 pages? Change the project. Nope, can't change the project. Okay. Can I bring 100 friends in on this? So they write a page each and I just observe them. <laughs> okay, so just trying to bring people on board so that you can, again, change the challenge and bring it into a flow state. Because you have the options of changing the challenge or changing your skill level. If you have time, then maybe you can enhance your skills. So you could meet this challenge in a flow state. It's up to you, but you have to think to yourself and you have to think if you're a manager, or if you're in charge of people, 
Does this person have the skills for the challenge I'm giving them? Am I going to help them get into flow or am I getting them in anxiety or boredom? We don't want either. So if you're the manager or if you're, if you're, if you're taking the task on, it's good to think this through before we accept or before we hand over a challenge. So these stress resiliency techniques, you'll pick of these 14 what works for you best. These are all evidence-based. Getting out in nature, we already talked about. Exercise, we know. Mindfulness. Meditation. Playing with a pet. Taking your vacation. Taking deep breaths. You know that when you have a long exhalation, that's when you turn on the parasympathetic response, the rest and digest. This is why I would recommend everyone take 10 deep breaths before sitting down at the table to consume your meal very mindfully because you'll be in rest and digest. You can actually absorb the nutrients. Or music, medical students love this one. That's their favorite one, listening to music to reduce stress. Some people say music and dance, practicing yoga, a laugh that goes back to amusement with our 10 positive emotions, right? A good laugh and a long sleep, best cures, Irish proverb, you probably know. Expressive writing can help us. Chewing gum, very simple, helps a lot of people. Less simple, checking email less frequently, but getting on a schedule. Check it at nine, say 12, say five, and don't be reacting to the notifications every minute, every day. Oh, got to check this, check this. Then we're just reacting, just being in reactive mode. We're not in thinking, planning, strategy mode. We want to try to take care of that inbox because that inbox is a significant stressor. But do that at a time when you can really absorb it, respond appropriately, make notes, put it in your calendar when you have to write in a, a date that you've agreed to. Be very purposeful with your email. That could really significantly change your life and your stress level. Now we're into social connection. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You may recognize this gentleman here, especially if you took psychology. I was a psychology and biology major at Harvard undergrad. Love psychology. So we have our physiologic needs, food, water, warmth, rest. Then we have safety needs, security, safety. And right above that, belonging and love needs, our relationships, our friends. We have esteem needs. Remember pride is one of those positive emotions. Prestige, feeling of accomplishment. This is from Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah, Barbara Fredrickson talks about it too. It's all based and rooted in the theories of psychology and then self-actualization, achieving one's full potential, including creative activities. So we have time to think. Self-fulfillment needs. Social connection is a pillar in lifestyle medicine. We know in COVID, we, many of us suffered. I wasn't able to see beyond my immediate family. Thank goodness my two boys and my husband were here with me and our dog, but I wasn't able to see the rest of my extended family. And it was hard. And I couldn't really see friends and couldn't see colleagues. So eventually, we, got, we all got onto Zoom and we were Zooming together. Sure. It was different, though. And, and we felt the pain of low social connection. Research from 2010, before the pandemic, though, it told us that lack of connection was dangerous. And these coronary artery disease patients in this study, socially isolated coronary artery disease patients, had a 2.4 times the risk of cardiac death compared to their more socially connected peers. We have a lot of patients who have coronary artery disease. Some of us may have risk factors for coronary artery disease and we're taking care of our exercise and our diet. Are we taking care of our social connections? Are we, are we thinking about if we're feeling lonely or if we're feeling connected? Are we connecting once a day, at least seven times a week? I hope so. Now we wanna to try to cultivate high quality connections. We can't have this with everyone. This is Jane Dutton's work. You can't have a high quality connection with everyone, but hopefully in your family, with your loved one, with your partner, you have this. With your children, you have this. Feelings of vitality and aliveness, feeling positive arousal and a heightened sense of positive energy. Heightened sense of positive regard. So the feeling of being known and being loved, it's mutual. Both parties in the connection are engaged and actively participating. The tie, they have greater emotional caring capacity, expression of both positive and negative emotion. So there's safety, psychological safety in these high quality connections. Now, I used to think just positive, positive. I just wanted to say positive things to people and keep the negative things to myself. And then it, it's a little bit hard because then you're carrying this yourself. 
you're burdening this yourself and you're not sharing your true self with others. So you, you can't get out of the burden. But if you share and say, you know, it makes me uncomfortable when this happens. I feel frustrated when this happens. I feel disappointed when this happens. That gives the other person an idea of what you need, who you are, how you feel. And then you can learn and grow from this. And that's key, learning and growing, bouncing back, having a growth mindset in the relationship. Realizing there's generativity in the relationship. In a high quality connection, there must be openness to new ideas and influence. And there must be an ability to deflect behaviors that shut down generative processes. What behaviors shut down growth? Love, connection. What, what behaviors will shut that down? Lying, cheating, saying one thing, doing another. Silent treatment, passive aggressive, bullying, threatening people. Oh, you know, you know these behaviors that shut down growth, that create distance, that create confusion, misunderstanding, anger disappointment, frustration. So we need to think about shutting those behaviors down, calling it out when you see it, saying this seems like passive aggressive treatment. Are you giving me the silent treatment? What's going on? This feels like the silent treatment. This is, this is going to squash generativity in the relationship, being open. We don't learn about this. We have a teen lifestyle medicine curriculum so that we can help our teens start learning how to cultivate high quality connections at a young age. Now, here we are at the end with a Gandhi quote, be the change you want to see in the world. So you've heard a lot about healthy lifestyles, the six pillars of lifestyle medicine, plus the other six dimensions. And I do have a free and available questionnaire called Paving Questionnaire, where you could actually look at these different dimensions and, and grade yourself with no shame, blame, or guilt, right? There's no shame, blame, or guilt in this room in your head and see where you are, what areas you'll find maybe uh, need some attention, areas of growth, some other areas that are going really well. This is a way of reflecting. You can use this, you can use other questionnaires. I don't get anything. You can just download this. It, it, this we have a nonprofit paving the path to wellness. We don't receive um, you know, any, any funds ourselves. It goes to paving the path to wellness if you happen to buy a book or something. And that's so that we can do these with underserved communities. We can help and do similar programs that we're doing with you today with people that cannot afford it. So we, we do believe that everyone can benefit, everyone, children, adults, elderly people can benefit from healthy body, peaceful mind, joyful heart, and these action steps that I've shared with you. I do have a free CME that you can take. It's called Improving Provider Health and Happiness through Harvard Medical School, through Spalding Rehab Hospital and Mass General Brigham. It's right here. It's just cpd.partners.org. If you just Googled Improving Provider Health and Happiness and Frady's, you'll, you'll get to it. It's free. It's six hours of what we just did <laughs> in the one hour, but you could do this for, for six hours. Um, I am so happy to have had this time with you. Thank you for having me, inviting me. I hope that this was useful and uh, I'm really appreciative for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Beth. That, Dr. Frades, that was wonderful. Um, I will apologize again to you for our beginning little <laughs> misstep and I don't know how it happened and I will apologize to you, all our participants today. Um, First time it happened to me, <laughs> live and learn. So we're going to turn on our growth mindset. Right. That's it. <laughs> and we're going to learn from that. And Savula, thank you for taking over that screen um, so quickly. So does anybody have any, um, any questions uh, for Dr. Frady's? Um, you can either put your hand up. I can try and get both screens back and forth, or you can put them in the chat. Uh, Dr. Bag. Thanks, Melanie. Uh, and <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Frades, for this presentation and the one that I listened to earlier today. It's not the first time I've heard you speak, but every time I do, I, I learn something. Oh. And um, <clears throat> so I have a I have a practical question for you. Um, as a physiatrist, uh, 
as you know, in every clinic that we do, be that stroke rehab or MSK or EMG, we're seeing folks who often would benefit from uh, a lot of counseling. You know, sometimes, as you say, two years of counts or two hours of counseling on one one or more of the pillars. And the challenge then is time management. You know, how, how do we do that? Uh, and 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 I think we need to do more of that, especially when I know that many of our patients now are losing family doctors, don't have a family doctor, and those that do have 10 to 15 minute appointments. So how how do we find that balance and stay in the flow with, with all of our other demands? Yeah, it, it is a great question, Stephen, and thank you so much. Thank you for coming back again uh, today. I really appreciate it and your words. So I would say a couple things. One is that if you can use the coach approach for five minutes in the visit where you ask the patient a question that's in a motivational interviewing style, like I mentioned, what would your life be like if you were able to eat more fruits and vegetables? What do you think you would see a, a difference? If you just ask them a question, so if you only have five minutes, instead of eat more fruits and vegetables, <laughs> instead taking this coach approach, motivational interviewing approach, leaving them food for thought, no, no real pun intended there, but leaving them to think about it and then, and then to remember to follow up with them the next time you see them. How did it go with that uh, thought about your fruit and vegetable? So if you can just use short questions, short periods of time to get them thinking, that'd be great. I would recommend partnering with a health coach, with a registered dietitian, perhaps with someone who's devoted their career to lifestyle medicine, perhaps someone that can do group visits and have shared medical appointments where the patient that you're seeing may have diabetes. Maybe one of your colleagues here is doing shared medical appointments on diabetes. You see if that patient would be interested in participating in the shared medical appointment where they'd learn all about diabetes and their own barriers and they could learn about strategies. So you might want to farm some of it out so that you don't burn out. Now, if you wanna change yourself around so you're able to do more of this, shared medical appointments are really a wonderful way to have 12 patients in the room. I, I sometimes, I've been up to 20 when it's a Zoom room um, and you can spend an hour. They, they go 60 to, well, 120, really 90 minutes, these shared medical appointments where 12 or 15 patients are with you for these 60 to 90 minutes. So they're getting a lot of you and you're able to share a lot with multiple patients in that arena. Does this help? Does this answer any, does this answer help you at all? Well, it does. Um, uh, what, what I'm thinking though, is it would be wonderful if we had those resources that we could share uh, our patient care with. And I'll certainly be asking uh, Melanie and some other colleagues in my department to probably know about know more about wellness resources than I do, um, because it would be wonderful if I could, uh, um, if not work together with these people in my own clinic, uh, have some resources where I can send patients that are interested in learning more about diet. I, I would say sleep and sleep and mood related issues are, are more common, well, mm -hmm. equally as common as, as the, the diet issues in, in my experience. Yeah, one thing is you can peruse the American College of Lifestyle Medicine's website. They do have free patient resources. So if you're looking for patient resources, that might be a, a, a something for you to do. Again, I don't get any money from this. We have the Paving the Path to Wellness book that patients and physicians actually are enjoying themselves, which has data and information and reflection questions, workshoppy work for the patients on sleep, on actually all the 12 dimensions we just went over, the six pillars plus. So there's a, there's a concrete book you could use. I am working on an online, Susan knows this, an online program where, for example, you could tell your patient to take this Paving the Path to Wellness program online. I mean, if we can make it free, all the better. 
and they could work online perhaps in a community online. That's something I really want to try to get moving on because it likely would help someone like you. Would that be a resource you would use? I'm just curious. Yeah, that, that does sound like a useful resource. Yeah. So I That's, should follow that. I find it fascinating because uh, it's in our world, I'm an anesthesiologist, which is very uh, different. <laughs> yeah. um, and things that are emerging in our field is prehab. Yes. Which again, focuses on nutrition, on exercise, on sleep, getting people ready for an operation if they have to wait for months or have ke neoadjuvant chemo first. It's all that prehab, which is, it takes many of the pillars um, of lifestyle medicine. And I find it's it's fascinating, the overlap. And a colleague has just developed a website um, to do that. Um, yeah, that's terrific. We have someone here, you may know Dr. Julie Silver over at Spalding at, at Harvard, who's been working in the prehab area too. And I'm seeing some of what's going on in the chat. And I do know family physicians, uh, they, they, you know, many of family physicians are getting certified in lifestyle medicine. You can get certified now. As of 2017, I was one of the four item writers for our exam in 2017. And we have thousands of physicians who are now board certified in lifestyle medicine. Several one, several from, from Harvard nowadays too, which is wonderful for, for me as I'm here. But many family physicians, this, this practice really resonates with them um, because uh, they, they get some concrete tools and, and resources like we're talking about to do exactly what they have enjoyed doing. And, and really that's the crux of, 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 of preventive medicine. Yeah. Yes. So, As Dr. Delva points out, the continuity that a family physician has is ideal um, to, to address that. Yeah. Um, we're going a bit over, but I would like one more question um, from Aus. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Freitas. That was an excellent talk. Uh, we enjoyed it. And it resonates because we we see the impact of you know stress and burnout. Yeah. How do you take this into implementation into your uh, teaching your your residents or mentees or uh, students? Yeah. And you know, I, I found not everyone recognizes the importance of well being, and they're so you know focused on. Oh, but I have to get that second research paper and. You don't understand this doesn't happen and it's hard to get them to see the big picture and a lot of these things doesn't matter doesn't really matter but it, it's hard to, to, to get the message across what are your thoughts on that thank you again i love this question because it is what i've been currently working on so one of the things that the surgery department did after i was with them for let's see three years they invited me into their mentoring sessions. So these are surgeons, highly academic at Mass General Hospital, and they are mentoring their early career physicians. So the young, they just graduated from their residencies. Now they have an academic position. And usually the mentoring sessions look at research, clinical competencies, right? And, and are, these, are these new attendings teaching? And are they giving back to the community? Well, I have to give a lot of uh, a lot of uh, gratitude uh, to Dr. Keith Lillamo, the chair of the Department of Surgery, who I'd worked with for three years, who said, "You know what? Let's bring a lifestyle medicine wellness expert into the early career mentoring." And so, what they do, to my very surprise and almost shock, is they talk a little bit about their academic papers, and they go say, "Oh, we have Dr. Frady's here." Okay. So now we're going to talk about well-being and now she's going to talk to you about work-life balance and, 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 and lifestyle. And so then I come in and I start asking them questions. I don't, I don't wag the finger. Remember, it's all motivational learning. I start asking them questions. I say, how are things going with this, with that? What would make a difference? And I, and I, and I get to the six pillars and these other six dimensions. And, and that is one way that it's been incorporated into the system at Mass General. Another way at HMS, at the Harvard Medical School, I do a lifestyle medicine interest group. I've had this since 2008, where it's a parallel curriculum and the students come and learn about lifestyle medicine. What they have been asking me about is, how do I get through medical school? So I teach them the pillars of lifestyle medicine, but then they want support. And during COVID, we had 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. It was COVID. I wanted to help them. 
they were struggling. We did 12 extra sessions weekly at the evening. Now this didn't burn me out because I wanted to do it. It was extra and it was <laughs> unpaid, but, but maybe this can get in. The hope was we could get this into the medical school. We could prove that it worked. And so the student of mine, Alexa Smith, she did a whole year with me as a scholarly project. We wrote this up called Wholehearted MD about how we went through all of these dimensions I just went through with you. We went through with the medical students in a quiet time, seven to eight, no one's getting graded, no shame, blame, guilt in the room. And when they heard about the growth mindset, you should have seen these faces. They were just, oh, so I learn and grow. I don't shame, blame, and guilt myself. I mean, it was really remarkable. And so then they had Alexis do a, a session this year. Um, she's a fourth year now. And just graduating, but they had her do a session. I was with her, but I, you know, we had her try to lead this the session with the medical students, and we're doing more of that in in well being. So the hope is it'll get it'll get integrated. It's not integrated right now. Hope is it'll get integrated into the Harvard Medical School system. With the residents, I teach the lifestyle medicine residency curriculum. So again, I'm teaching the life the pillars. But what happens? They end up talking about themselves. They end up saying. Well, I got kids and I'm not sleeping. And I, and then we start talking about well being and their own well being in those sessions. So basically, whenever I can, I try to use this motivational interviewing approach with students, residents, mentees, early careers, uh, professionals, physicians, healthcare providers, and, and start asking about these 12 dimensions that we reviewed today. Does that help? Very much, very much. It, it, you know, I know there's no one answer for that, but I think it really helps trying to address it at every level. Thank you. Right, exactly. Oh, oh, I forgot to say. And then the last thing we did for physicians, I can't believe we got this passed. So there's Grand Rounds, right? At Spalding, every noontime Friday. So four of us got together and we said, hey, can we make these well-being rounds? They said, well, what, what do you mean? We said, oh no, we'll have lots of data, lots of research in there. And we'll do it for half hour with all the research and the CME, all the research. And then we'll have a half hour of breakout session. So then we break them out and they start connecting with each other and talking about well-being. We did social connection once, we did sense of purpose another time, we did laughter another time in our well-being rounds for CME. So it added no extra time. They're going to go to noontime grand rounds anyway. And now it's well-being rounds. So that's another way just to get it in there. It's already locked in 12 o'clock Friday, but now they're getting well-being rounds instead of grand rounds. Forgot that. Excellent. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic way of incorporating it. And I'm always amazed how many of our students and residents demonstrate growth mindsets every day. It's, um, it's quite impressive. I think they learn. Remember when I mentioned we, we talked about it in, me, in Harvard Medical School? I think, if I'm not mistaken, my boys are 23 and 21 now, but when they were in middle school, so I'm forgetting, you know, say they were 12, so a decade ago, their teachers also yeah. in middle school we're talking about this. I said, this is crazy. I'm talking about this in medicine. And the boys were learning this in middle school. So the next generation got to learn it so much earlier. I know, same kids are the same age. <laughs> which is great. We just have to reinforce it because I am finding with some of the residents, maybe they're, early, maybe they're older, so they sort of missed it. You know, the 30 somethings, I'm not sure. But they, they need it again. Those <laughs> residents, they need this growth mindset again. So any other questions? We'll probably have to wrap it up. We're 15 minutes over as it is. And I know everybody has to eat healthy and have time to walk home or exercise. <laughs> so exactly. to thank you once again, Dr. Frades. Um, that was so inspiring and has given us a lot to think about. Thank you so very we much. I really appreciate